justice system and welcome to my eighth COVID-19 virtual town hall. I'm very proud to represent the 24th Council District, which includes the neighborhoods of Kew Gardens Hills, Pominock, Electchester, Fresh Meadows, Hillcrest, Jamaica Estates, Briarwood, Parkway Village, Jamaica Hills, and Jamaica. I hope everyone is receiving our daily COVID-19 email updates and seeing them on Facebook. If you are not and you wish to sign up, there is a link to sign up on my COVID-19 information webpage on the City Council. Um, my COVID-19 webpage also has an archive of previous days, emails, and town halls. And I can assure you that our daily email is interesting, informative, and something that you will look forward to every single day. Our district office is open for business virtually. You can call us at 718-217-4969. You can email us at Rory Lansman, no, sorry, at rlansman at council.nyc.gov. You can tweet at us at Rory Lansman, or you can send us a message via Facebook. My entire staff is working from home, and we have helped a lot of people uh, solve the individual problems or answer questions during this crisis that they have. Now, tonight's town hall is focused on small businesses and their issues and their needs. Small businesses anchor our communities. They create jobs and they add to the vibrancy of the city's neighborhoods. Of the more than 200,000 businesses located in New York City, 98% are small businesses, meaning they have fewer than 100 employees. 89% are very small, fewer than 20 employee, employees. These small businesses employ more than half of New York City's private sector workforce. In New York, the epicenter of the coronavirus in the United States, less than 20% of small businesses have been approved to receive the federal PPP loans. In contrast, more than 55% of small businesses in Nebraska are expecting PPP funding. I've been to Nebraska twice, once to take a deposition in the middle of a February snowstorm, and another time on my way to a summer job in Colorado where I got a speeding ticket in Nebraska. I almost made it from New York to Colorado without getting a ticket, but they got me in Nebraska. My point is, there's not a lot of people in Nebraska, so we should be getting a lot more of those PPP loans than we are. At the start of the pandemic, the New York City Office of Small Business Services created loan and grant programs to aid the city's small uh, businesses. But the $59 million in funding has run out. The largest expense for many small businesses in New York is rent. The Community House Improvement Program, which represents around 4,000 landlords and rent stabilized apartment buildings said this week that among its members who also have commercial tenants, two thirds of those commercial tenants did not pay rent in April and May. Nearly nine out of 10 city restaurants missed at least part of May's rent, according to a survey by the New York City Hospitality Alliance. Mayor de Blasio said today it's possible New York City will start phase one of reopening in the first half of June. Phase one is restricted to construction, manufacturing, wholesale trade, and retail, limited to curbside or in-store pickup. One of the biggest issues for many businesses is what the economy will look like when they open, reopen for business. That means small business owners may need to find new ways to deliver their products, dust off old ideas, experiment with existing strengths, or search for new customers. The bottom line is what we all know, Small businesses are hurting. They're getting crushed during this pandemic. And we're here tonight to talk about what the city and maybe even the state and the federal government uh, is doing to help and also what kind of uh, legal and other issues our small businesses might have that need addressing. We have um, some excellent people to speak with us this evening. We have Deshaun Mars, who is the Director of Business Outreach 
for the New York City Department of Small Businesses. We have Chevron Small, Chevron Small, excuse me, the Supervising Attorney, the Community Development Project of the Legal Aid Society. We have Tashi Lua, Supervising Attorney of the Consumer Law Unit at the Legal Aid Society. Susan Chase, a Staff Attorney at the Community and Economic Development Unit at the Legal Aid Society. And Rolando Gonzalez, a Staff Attorney community of, at the Community and Economic Development Unit of the Legal Aid Society. I'm concerned that there's no one left at the Legal Aid Society if anyone <laughs> calls right now. So no. I hope that you have forwarded all of those calls to this Zoom conference. Um, but we're very, very appreciative uh, of all of you being here this evening. And I know we are going to get some good information. For those of you, before we get to our um, uh, introductory uh, statements, uh, for those of you who have Zoomed in uh, to join us, you can open the Q&A window in your Zoom control panel and tell us what your question is and we can put you in the queue and give you a chance to uh, ask questions directly. Or if you have called in and cannot uh, uh, use the Zoom function, you can email your question or text them and we will try to get to them. The email address is cd24sam, as in Council District 24, cd24sam at gmail.com, or you can text them to 347-498-4826. That's 347-498-4826. So with that, let's get started. Um, and uh, Deshaun Mars, the Director of Business Outreach for uh, SBS, uh, please uh, introduce yourself, uh, tell us uh, what your role is, what, what SPS does, um, and, and whatever else you want to uh, tell us that you think uh, our small businesses should know uh, before we get to the, the, the Q&A. All right, thank you. So good evening. I hope everyone is doing well. Thank you, Council Member. It's good to be here talking to our Queens community. I'm a Brooklyn guy, so do not hold that against me, but my wife and I go to church in Jamaica, so... Go Queens here. So which, again, my name. Which, which church? Where do you go? Oh, we go to Greater Allen Cathedral. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't yeah, know if you yeah, saw, yeah. but the, um, the 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 governor announced that um, uh, the his interfaith advisory council and both uh, Reverend Flake uh, and his wife Reverend Elaine Flake uh, are both on that council. So so Allen, a wonderful institution. Yeah, no, yeah, definitely dear to our heart. And I hope I saw that they, they've opened up as a testing site as well. So. Very critical for the community. So again, good evening. My name is Deshaun Mars, and I am from the New York City Department of Small Business Services. What I'll do really quickly, I'll talk a bit about what we do at SBS. So what we did pre-COVID-19, the services that we're providing now, some of the technical assistance that you can get access to from our agency, and some of the financial resources that business owners can get now, both through our agency and then also through the federal government. So for anyone who has not heard of SBS, we are the New York City Department of Small Business Services. And what we do is we work with entrepreneurs, business owners, anyone looking to start, grow, or, or expand their businesses, we can help you do that. We have local business solution centers all throughout New York City where you can get access to financing, if you're an entrepreneur and you have a random business idea, but you're not quite sure where to take it to that next level, we have legal assistance that can help you incorporate your business. We have business courses where you can get courses on marketing. You can get help with your business plan. So anything that you need to do to start, operate, or grow your business, you can get that from SBS. Now, before COVID-19, like I just mentioned, our local business solution centers, we used to be able to walk in and get access to any one of our services, but right now we're doing everything virtually. So we have online courses that you can still get access to. If you're looking for financing, which I'll talk about in a minute, we, we're also doing virtual sessions to help people get access to different financing options. So we're doing everything virtually at the moment. If you are looking for employment, SBS has workforce career centers, over 20 of them throughout New York City. 
These are also centers where you can work with our staff members to figure out what type of employment you're looking for, what type of skill set you have. And we're working with a number of employers now that are still hiring. So we have a workforce career center. So the council member talked about how small businesses are the backbone of our local economy. And that is absolutely correct. That's why we're working really, really hard to make sure that business owners have access to the information that they need. The council member also talked about, we had a grant and a loan program that the city rolled out about a month or two ago. We had a grant and loan program. So for anyone who has already applied, we're still looking through those applications, but there's such an incredible need at the moment for financing capital, for money for small business owners to make sure they can still cover their payroll, they can cover their rent, their mortgages, their utilities. So right now, what we're doing every single day, our agency is hosting webinars to let people know about the financing options that are available from the Small Business Administration, SBA. That's the federal government. There are two main programs that people can get access to now. One is the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. And the second one, which I'll talk about right now, is the Paycheck Protection Program. So for any businesses that agrees to keep on their staff members for at least eight weeks, the federal government will give you a forgivable loan up to two and a half times your payroll. So again, eight weeks, if you agree to keep on your employees, the federal government will pay for up to eight weeks of your payroll cost. That is a forgivable loan. So if you use at least 75% of that money towards your payroll cost, SBA, that money will become forgivable and it will turn into a grant. Our team is also hosting small group sessions to let people go in depth about how to get access to the Paycheck Protection Program and other SBA products. I'll make sure that everyone has the links so you can sign up for our webinars and for our financing assistance. But if you go to nyc.gov slash COVID19DIZ, that's nyc.gov slash COVID19BIZ, you will see all the information about our daily webinars where we're giving information about all of our financial resources. And you can also sign up for financial assistance so where we can connect you to not only financing assistance in New York City, but we're also doing technical assistance to help connect people to SBA financing. Terrific, thank you very much. Um, so Siobhan is, Siobhan Small, the supervising attorney for the Community Development Project at the Legal Aid Society. Uh, Siobhan, welcome, and please introduce yourself. Uh, tell us what the Community Development Project does and, and what you think that our uh, small business uh, owners need to know. Thank you very much, Council Member Lanceman. We really appreciate it. Um, um, you know, the Legal Aid Society has been around for uh, quite a while, and a lot of folks know us for our um, work with housing, you know, around um, tenants, tenants' rights issues, immigration. But a lot of folks don't realize that we've had um, a community development project helping small business owners for um, over 20 years. So we um, work with small businesses, um, nonprofits, um, low income um, co ops, HDFCs. We help folks um, pick the proper legal structure. We help them with navigating insurance issues, um, lease negotiation, commercial lease review, and um, and negotiation um, at this time of COVID-19. And we've, we've really been around for, you know, providing services during 9-11, during Superstorm Sandy. And, and now that COVID-19 pandemic is upon us, we remain open and available to provide assistance to all business owners um, at this time. So we have some business owners who are still interested in, in, in starting a business and we're here for them. We have here for them to get um, the business up and running. Um, and the businesses who oh, unfortunately are struggling at this time, uh, we um, are, are here to help them navigate the various um, grants and loan programs out there. You know, PPP unfortunately has not been um, very successful in our communities, um, but we're here to help people, you know, try to see what other programs and, and sources of funding 
are available to them. Um, so it, it's, you know, I, I'm not going to speak a long time. I, I brought, you know, as you, as you said, Council Member Lansman, we were all deep and I brought the experts with me. I, I brought Susan, I brought Rolando, um, because those are the folks who have been on the ground for years, you know, working with um, small business um, small business services, providing trainings to low, um, to low income small businesses, providing other resources out there. You know, we are on the streets, we're in the Zoom meetings, um, day in and day out, speaking to small business owners and trying to provide assistance to them. Um, I also brought Tashi because Tashi could tell you that, uh, unfortunately, um, a lot of you small businesses out there, you know that at the end of the day, oftentimes you're on the hook for a lot, for, um, a lot of the business um, debt. So you're on the hook, you have some personal liability and our consumer law unit could help you navigate those claims, could help you figure out the best way to to go about resolving those issues. So not only does our small business or a small business um, um, unit, the community development project, help people navigate those business issues and those um, you know employment issues, um, lease issues, et cetera, but we are there for the business owners themselves on a personal level to help them navigate the debts that they may inc um, incur as a result of you know, this COVID-19 pandemic and, and beyond. So thank you. Uh, we very much look forward to your um, constituents' questions, and we hope we, to get their calls um, later on. So you can reach us um, at the Legal Aid Society either by reaching out to Council Member Lanceman and his staff um, at the email address he gave you, or you can reach us at communitydevproject at legal-aid.org. That's communitydevproject at legal-aid.org or by giving us a call at 212-426-3000. That's 212-426-3000. We're working virtually and we're here for you, so please um, reach out to us, and thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, uh, does anyone else from, uh, is anyone else from Legal Aid gonna give sort of introductory comments or just there for questions? They're there for questions, we were here for questions. Good, excellent. All right, so, um, let me follow up on something that, that you mentioned, the, 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 um, the, the PPP uh, program. Um, can, can someone just lay out for us, what is the program? What are its eligibility requirements? And any insight you have into um, why New York City businesses haven't, haven't done better by, the, by that program? Rolando? Sam, we gotta get Rolando. Free Rolando. <laughs> there we go. Um, the PPP is primarily um, geared towards having um, businesses um, bring back employees and keeping them on the payroll and 75% of um, the money is forgivable if it's used for, well, 100% is forgivable, but 75% is supposed to be used for um, payroll expenses, and then the additional 25% can be used for rent, utilities, and other expenses. Um, I think one of the issues has been um, a lot of small businesses having relationships with banks, a lot of small businesses being able to sort of navigate that system where some of the larger businesses already have relationships with banks and are able to um, work directly with their banks. Um, one of the key things about the PPP is that if, if um, employers don't bring back the same number of employees that they had or that they had previously um, provided when they um, submitted the, uh, um, the application, they may actually then have to pay back part of the loan. Um, so I'm sure Deshaun can also talk about this a little bit as well. And I'd also like to add that, you know, at this point, it seems like employers are competing with the unemployment insurance program because unemployment insurance was, you know, it was stepped up $600 additional um, per, per week. And what that does is that employers are now trying to get folks back on the payroll. However, these individuals that they're trying to bring back may find it, you know, more um, financially beneficial to them to stay on the unemployment rolls because they may actually get more money per week in unemployment than they would receive if they went back to work. So there's a competing um, issue there, and, and it's really making it difficult for the, the few employers who did um, receive PPP um, um, loans or grants, it made it difficult for them to, to actually bring folks back. And, you know, at the outset, as Rolando said, you know, people had a difficult time navigating all these PPP, EIDL, the city, state, federal programs, 
it became very confusing and a bunch, you know, a bundle of, of you know, as, as they say, alphabet soup. So people did not know how, where, where, to, where, to, where to go. Um, but the folks who were able to, to hit the ground running, people who had relationships with the banks, people, um, you know, the big businesses, we've heard stories about um, for um, um, Shake Shack, we've heard stories about um, the Los Angeles Lakers, you know, receiving these loans because those people are the ones who are able to have very close relationship with their bankers and could say, hey, and they could hire lawyers and they could hire um, other professionals to put the application together. Whereas our small pop, mom and pop stores, you know, our folks in, in Jamaica, Queens, our folks around um, Jamaica Hills, et cetera, they, 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 they just don't have those resources or don't have the financial wherewithal in order to put the applications together. So what they need to do is contact um, Deshaun, they need to contact us so we could help them um, navigate those programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and just to give people some more context about where this money is coming from, it's from SBA, from the federal government, but it's administered and distributed through your local lenders. So my friends over here at Legal Aid were exactly right, that if you had a relationship with a traditional bank who was an SBI, SBA certified lender, people were leveraging those relationships because no one expected this pandemic. SBA, what they did was get this information up, up about their Paycheck Protection Program actually fairly quickly. So there was a lot of confusion about how the funds needed to be used. When they were rolling out, the rules were changing. So even the SBA lenders were a bit confused about how to use that money. Some banks were expected to administer a certain number of loans and a certain amount of loans, which was far greater than what they've done previously. So a little bit of context, a lot of confusion about this program that rolled out really, really quickly. What happened for the first round, SBA, PPP, ran out of money. There was no mechanism to force the banks to work with business owners that did not have a relationship with them already. We know that a lot of businesses of color, low income businesses, immigrant businesses may not have that traditional banking relationship. So those are businesses that were shut out of the process. But there are a number of CDFIs and other lenders that are SBA, that are SBA certified that can give the money out. So what I can do is in the chat, I'll put a link to where you can see who are all of the SBA certified lenders in this area. So for anyone who does not have a traditional banking relationship, there are a number of different lenders that you can work with. So you may just need to be very diligent to try to work with different lenders. But my friends over here at, at Legal Aid were exactly right. People were leveraging their relationships with some of the bigger banks. And some of the bigger banks, they get more bang for their buck if they're, getting, if they're giving out larger loans. So there wasn't a mechanism to force banks to make sure that smaller mom and pops were getting that funding, but we're hopefully we're hopeful that that'll change with the expansion of the SBA lenders who can actually give out the Paycheck Protection Program money. We have a question, um, a good question from Luzdari Geraldo. Uh, Luzdari, you there? Yes, I am. Oh, welcome. Thank you for Hi, joining thank us. You. Um, uh, please ask your question to the panel. Uh, so for street vendors, uh, like street vendors and freelancers, um, they've been having so much trouble in getting any assistance, loans. Is there anything for them? And also uh, about immigration, um, what their immigration status need to be in order to qualify for these uh, loans. Susan? Three, three excellent uh, questions all in one. Can street vendors apply for these loans, these uh, support programs? Can freelancers supply, apply for these programs? And um, are there any obstacles or exclusion based on someone's immigration status? And I'm gonna ask a, a subsect, sub part of that question. Should any, assuming that they're, they're not, I hope at least the city programs are available irrespective of someone's immigration status, should someone who has an undocumented status be worried about applying for one of these programs? So who wants to, to take those four questions or any part of it? So I, I can start with the, the question about the freelancers. 
Mm -hmm. So for the Paycheck Protection Program, there are very strict definitions about what it means to be an employee. So if you have a business and you employ 1099 independent contractors, these are people who are not on your official payroll. Those people would not count towards the amount of money that you would get part of the Paycheck Protection Program since the federal government's definition of what an employee is, is somebody who's on your actual payroll. But if you are a business owner, you're a freelancer, and you are paying yourself a salary, you can still get access to the Paycheck Protection Program. My suggestion would be work with your, with your accountant, whoever you do your taxes with, and if you have a relationship with an SBA lender, talk to them about some of the specific rules around being a freelancer and independent contractor, because there are some specific definitions about what it means to be a business owner who employs employees and how much money you can get access to. And in terms of the, the street vendors, it, from my understanding, it doesn't necessarily matter what type of business you have. It matters what your, if you, it, what's your incorporation. So what type of business do you have? If you employ X amount of employees, do you pay independent contractors? Are you on payroll yourself? Those are the most important things as you're thinking about what types of programs you can get access to. Not necessarily if you're running a street cart or you have a street vending, that's less important. But what's more important is about the structure of your business, how many people you employ, and the definition of those employees. Can anyone talk about the immigration aspects of it? So with immigration, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the Patient Protection Program does fall under the CARES Act, and the CARES Act was very um, strict with regards to how it viewed um, folks who were undocumented. Um, so technically, you know, there was the stimulus program, which um, pretty much strictly forbid anybody who was undocumented from um, accessing those, those funds. So I suspect that unless you are, um, so, and then on the Paycheck Protection Program side, you know, anyone who is the sole proprietor, you know, you, you, know, you were, may have been self-employed, you may have been an LLC or whatever it is, you probably would be able to um, access those funds. However, I'd be very careful if I were undocumented and a sole proprietor, because you don't want to run up against the rules that say that um, you're taking advantage of um, a, public, a public benefit. So I think you would have to speak to your, um, your, an immigration lawyer if you were a sole proprietor or if you were an LLC, if you were a corporation and you're taking your, and you're paying yourself a salary, that may be a little different. But if you were a sole proprietor or, or you know, just relying on a Schedule C, um, I would be very careful and I would speak to a, an attorney about my particular status. Okay, um, so some of the questions that we get coming in are, are anonymous or, or people don't want to go on the video and, and, and ask them themselves. So uh, let me ask, uh, let me ask something. Um, can, can maybe Deshaun, can you tell us uh, what looks like it's about to be uh, permitted to, to reopen? What, what counts as manufacturing? What counts as wholesale trade? Um, can people open a, a, a small, a small office? Um, what's the next phase in, in, business activity it's going to be permitted. Mm. Yeah, so I was just reading a couple of reports that in June, it looks like the first phase is going to start happening. But we're still waiting on guidance from Governor Cuomo, from Mayor de Blasio, about what those metrics look like and how we can safely reopen. We've been communicating very, very closely with our regulatory agency partners. So that's Department of Health, Department of Environmental Protection, Department of Sanitation. We're working with all of our agency partners to understand what are some of the new regulations and rules that people need to be mindful of as we start to reopen. So those conversations right now are ongoing, but we are waiting for guidance from the governor and the mayor to figure out when we can start reopening. But it's our goal as a team, as an agency, to make sure that people understand what the different rules are so everyone can be operating safely 
once we're okay to start opening? You know, when, um, when it comes yes. to... Uh, when it comes to the, the regulations, I think one thing um, a lot of the business owners need to be um, a little bit careful of is that there's a, a, a moratorium on on um, evictions, and in a few, you know, in about a month or so, that's going to be um, gone. So, you know, that's one of the things that you know it's a, it's a rule that's already in place is going to basically expire or sunset. And you know, small business owners need to realize that you know their their landlords may um, come after them for um, that rent. So there's the, the, if the moratorium was only on evictions. It wasn't on paying. So it's something that, you know, we need to be concerned about. Um, and people, you know, so they need to reach out to be a little bit more proactive, reach out to us, reach out to Deshaun, um, because it's something that, and even reach out definitely to reach out to our community um, law, consumer law unit, Iftashi, because of the fact that these individuals, you know, they have good guy clauses in their leases, they have personal liability um, based on those leases. So it's something that people need to be very concerned about in, a, in about a month or so. I would also add, this is Tashi Lewa from the Consumer Law Project. I would also just add to what Shervon said, um, even though the eviction moratorium, I believe is now gonna be pushed till August, if the courts open before that, we can also expect a flood of rent arrear cases or commercial uh, rent arrears, which could be brought separately from an eviction action. So that's something that we, as a unit are expecting as well, not just residential rent arrears, but also in the commercial context. Yes. As far as um, commercial tenants, what I've been, most of the cases we've been getting from um, businesses impacted by COVID-19 have been with their commercial leases. Where we can really help is to be able to review a commercial tenant's lease and let them know what their rights are, what the obligations are, um, it's important to reach out and try to negotiate with the landlord and try to work out some solution because you're both sort of in the same situation. You want to be able to, to be able to make money to be able to pay the landlord. Um, but before negotiating in a vacuum, it's important to know what's in your lease, what your rights are, and it's important to know that you can negotiate anything. It's not just the rent, anything that's going to be able to help you to be able to succeed and be able to pay the rent. So for example, it might be a lease extension or at least renew that you didn't have, or it might be negotiating a short-term workout during these next few months, or expanding the use clause. So reach out to us, we can help you sort of strategize and, and determine what's the best course to take with your landlord. Got it, okay. I just wanna make an observation, you know, we're going through the city budget process um, right now, and obviously it's a tremendous amount of, money that has to be cut from, from what was the preliminary budget down to the one that we have to, to finalize. Um, and it is comforting to know that neither um, legal aid, which gets a, a lot of money from the city or uh, SBS, obviously a city agency, is wasting any of that on um, fancy uh, office space or, or, or virtual background. <laughs> Thank you. You know, we, we run a tight ship and we keep our belts tight too. <laughs> good. We're, we're good stewards of the taxpayers taxpayer dollars. Um, whereas I, on the other hand, make my office drive me out to sit in front of city hall with a whole studio <laughs> behind me, which you can't, can't see it. That's really where I am right now. Um, okay, so let's ask um, a, a question that the council tried to deal with in legislation. The, the, the personal liability, you know, mm -hmm. it's a tra terrible situation. Somebody, the business can't be sustained. They've got to break their lease. They've, they've got to, they're going to go out of business. What are the personal liability issues that a small business owner might, might have um, if, they, if they break their lease um, and, and are not able to continue in, in business? Oh, can this, this. Go ahead, Tashi. Go ahead, Rolando. Go ahead. I'm, sure, I'm sure you'll be more informed. So it's important to review the lease, but just about hardly any lease has a cancellation clause so it's a matter of going through the lease most commercial tenants most small business commercial tenants have a personal guarantee so it's a matter of looking at what they're responsible for are they responsible for their present rent the future rent who's who's the tenant on the lease is it a um corporation a limited liability company or did the person sign in their own name what are they personally responsible for? And if they have a good guy clause, 
how can they get out and limit their personal liability moving forward? Most likely tenants are gonna be responsible for rent, um, additional rent, which usually is anything else in the lease that's not rent, that's um, property taxes, late fees, um, interest, it might be utilities, common charges, um, but all of that can be negotiated. But a tenant could be responsible for um, rent, additional rent, and maybe um, damages as well for breaking the lease. And just to add to what Rolando said, it goes beyond just rent that we see this often and sometimes it's in the you know, equipment leasing context where we have this personal guarantor requirement. Um, and this is really bad in, in context where we've seen it is where we deal with confessions or judgment, right? So this is one context where there's been some legislation, I think last year that would limit it out of state debtors from facing liability uh, through confessions or judgments that are filed in New York. But, but the same doesn't apply to, you know, to New Yorkers. And this is something that's, the whole idea of confessions of judgment is very troubling, where it just sort of waives the individual's right to appear in court. And, um, you know, taking a step back, I think as, as a consumer practitioner, we have some of the strongest consumer protection legislation or laws here in New York, whether it's um, at the federal level, we have the FDCPA, the Fair Debt Coalition Practices Act. Uh, we have debt collection regulations with the Department of Financial Services at the state level, and we have the Department of Consumer Affairs, or what was what's now the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. Um, so all these regulations are there, but one thing that is missing is the small business owners, right? Whether it's a taxi medallion um, owner, cab driver, um, or others, where we don't have these protections, and we see it's it's again it's individuals who are legally very you know less sophisticated, dealing with very complex issues of, of contract law and face you know, confessions of judgment and really abusive terms. So that's something that, that does require a legislative fix. I don't know if this uh, was touched on, but some business owners have business interruption insurance. Um, do you have any uh, experience with, with um, uh, business owners trying to, 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 to make a claim? Does this situation apply? Anyone can help with that, with, with that issue? So we, we do, so the, with the business interruption, insur interruption insurance, basically folks, is you know, people have been paying their insurance premiums for years, hoping that if there is a fire, if there was some kind of other disaster to their business, um, that they were going to be able to, um, you know, look towards their insurance policies and get covered. But we, you know, what we've seen is that for the most part, um, the insurance industry has basically said that this um, um, pandemic is not covered under business interruption insurance. But I, I actually think that um, we, we've taken a look and we agree. So we, we agree on to some extent that that may be possible. And what we've seen is that the insurance companies have been denying claims. However, we actually think that it goes further than that. We the basically case law, I think, is on um, our small business owner's side because there are a number of cases that say that basically you don't need to have a physical damage to the business. If you, if you know, if this, the government said you know to to close your, your doors and to stay home, then technically you don't have access to your to your um, your, your building. I mean, you may have you may have well had a, a fire in this in this space because again you would not have access to it. You would not have the use and occupancy of the of the space in order to earn um, a, a living and to pay your staff and et cetera. So we actually feel like people should um, at least file um, um, claims under the insurance policies um, because also the state, there is a state um, um, bill out there. I think he froze. He froze. So I think I'll, I'll just pick up. So I think that- I was, I was waiting for when you were gonna get a chance to chime oh, in here. I, oh. So with re, with respect to insurance policies, you should definitely- to try, to get those, uh, try to get those bills moving forward because it is going to be a huge benefit to people who could not take advantage of PPP, who could not take advantage of EIDL, who could not take advantage of other city and state um, programs. So. Again, they should get a, they should get a return on the investment from the insurance policies, and we feel like the case law um, is on their side. Although the insurance companies may um, deny those those claims. Uh, 
Um, Susan, you're going to say something? So, yeah, so the issue really is that is if you're going to sue the insurance companies and how you're going to do that. So there really has to be a class action. So the best thing to do is go ahead and make the claim, even though it might be denied. Um, there are a couple of provisions. You have to read the claim carefully. And what, what I found after some disasters have hit um, is that a lot of agents will sell you these claims and make these promises and we as the consumer don't read what it says and we don't actually know what it's going to give us so it, it often we think we might have coverage and we don't so it's important the onus is on us when we deal with an agent to make sure we get some proof we know who that agent is there are a lot of unscrupulous people out here who will get us to sign and, and sign up for these insurances and then they, and then they cover us but you should make the claim The it usually says there actually has to be physical damage, but sometimes the damage can be lack of access. So there are certain common law um, causes of action, like what's called constructive eviction. You can't use the elevator because it's no way that, you know, you can socially distance because the elevator can't be used. Or we have one instance where you know, the, the landlord has closed the building. If he's, if the landlord takes an affirmative step to do something, then how can you, it's not, it's not fit for the use for the building. So there are certain common law causes of action. Um, but, and then some business continuity insurances will protect for, for, for other things. So um, what, what might not have a government exclusion, but those are usually really expensive policies. So, um, and, and many times we just don't have that policy, but always make the claim. Thank you. The um, question uh, has been asked about uh, utility bills. Um, Con Ed, um, the, uh, these are public utilities. Has, has anything been done to um, uh, require Con Ed to uh, give any kind of utility bill relief? Do small businesses have any options there? Are there any programs, et cetera? I'm just going to point at someone. <laughs> No, I'm thinking about it, um, um, Councilman, but actually leave there. So, yeah, so Tasha could, could go ahead, Tasha, first. Yeah. No, so I was just going to mention, I, and I think I, this applies to residential utilities primarily, but I think to some extent it does apply to commercial. Um, and you have the, the State Public Service Commission. I, I know that the Con Ed, National Grid, um, the large utility providers, some of the others, um, have taken measures on their own to halt um, collections, um, shutoffs, um, they've taken some steps by themselves, but even before the pandemic, I think the State Public Service Commission was somewhere where we would reach out for, um, it used to be residential um, cases that we reached out to, but I think it also applies to commercial. And they've been a great resource, as long as the individual has tried to first at least try to contact or resolve it with the service provider. Um, thereafter, the Public Service Commission you know, has will, will reach out to the providers, um, to see to mediate or try to come to a resolution and i our experience has in representing our clients has always been the public service commission and I, I know for con ed and national grid they won't shut off your service for non-payment so i would just confirm directly with your utilities company but this is some information that we're sharing on our daily webinars We'll go through Verizon, Spectrum, Con Ed, and National Grid, and some of the things that they're doing now. But I know that for a lot of our utility companies, they aren't going to shut off your service for non-payment during this time. You know, I wanted to say one other thing just about um, when you agree to reduce a payment, especially with the commercial leases, you want to make sure you're, you get your landlord um, to put that in writing for you. Um, it has to be memorialized, and most of the uh, the contracts or the um, the leases say that. So they may say, "Oh, I'm going to reduce your rent by 30 percent, or 40 percent, or 50 percent." And later, if something happens, they can come back, and if they hadn't memorialized it, they can come back and ask you for that money. So you want to be careful. Um, 
to to put it in writing and both parties sign it so that it so that you can enforce it if anything happens in the future. Um, I put a little bit about the good guy clause in in the um, chat, but I just wanted you also to understand that if you abandon your property, you may still have to be responsible for the remainder of that lease. So you can't say I'm just going to um, to to leave. Um, we we've had people call saying, oh, I just was leave I just left but they're asking me for the money but what happens what's going to happen really is at this point it may be difficult for the landlord to find someone else to rent that property there might be a, a surplus in space so the landlord can come after you to for the term of that lease so if he did and if you have a personal guarantee then you're stuck if it's not in the name of your company. So you want to be careful that even if you're going to surrender, you try to get something in writing, settling with for a predetermined amount that you can get out of or remove yourself from liability. Just to briefly add to what Susan said, um, you know, you have a, a landlord's duty to mitigate when it comes to residential leases. That is not so on commercial leases. The case law on that is very bad. Um, I think in some instances, you know, where someone breaks a lease early uh, for a business, you know, the landlord doesn't have to wait for the lease to expire before they go after for the remainder of the lease. They have clauses where they say this is just liquidated damages. So as you break that lease, they will sue you before the even the end of the lease for that entire remaining period. So this is, um, I don't know if we've covered this exactly, but um, Tashi, just to, to follow up on, on that or, or, or Susan, um, can, can a business um, try to renegotiate their lease with their, their landlord? And is that something that the Legal Aid Society, your unit, um, can, can help them with? Um, yes, um, at least it's a contract. Contracts are mean, meant to be changed. Um, sometimes they're broken, and and that's what the, that's one of the things we do. Um, and we try to help you understand your position in renegotiating. And and it's not always bad. Um, everybody's in this together, right? So uh, the landlord would rather have a, a good person, a good tenant who's been paying, probably pay a little bit less or less and keep them there than to have a vacant building. And, and so we have to look at, you know, what is the perspective of the landlord? What's his positioning? They don't always have the better bargaining power. You may. Um, they also might have some lender requirements. So that might mean that you have to show that there is a loss and you have to give them certain documentation to say, you know, we have a loss. But if you could prove that loss, they may be able to reduce the rent ongoing. You want to have this discussion early rather than later. Um, you, you don't want to wait in, in, to the last minute. Say, listen, I'm having a problem while the problem is happening so that you can come up with a solution. Leasing is market driven, and this is probably a good time for tenants to reach out to the landlord. I always tell tenants, reach out to the landlord when you have a problem. You're better off trying to deal with the solution now rather than the landlord waiting and the landlord taking you to court because you then may be responsible for attorney's fees and other fees um, if you wait till you be, you're taken to court. But everything can be negotiated. Right now, I've had tenants that have negotiated short term um, workouts for the next few months. Um, they've had to renegotiate the leases because they're paying a smaller amount of their commercial rent and pushing it back over the term of the lease. So it is, as Susan mentioned, it's important to get everything in writing, but a lot of tenants are working with their landlords, renegotiating so that they can stay in business during these next few months. Yeah, just to, to you know, I don't mind being redundant here, but it's, it's important for tenants to realize that, again, as folks have stated, they actually may be in a position of power at this point because of the mere fact that the landlord may not be able to get anyone back in the space. So you, you cannot be timid, you cannot be shy, you have to move forward now because at this point, you know, as I said, the landlord may not be able to get anyone to move back and to move into your space because everyone is hurting. So it, it will be better to get someone who is paying less that they know 
um, and that, that that has a contract with them than to get you know, leave the place vacant and hope and cross their fingers, wishing that someone is going to step in um, to the remaining lease term. So you know you are you tenants are in a better position than they may realize at this at this time. But let's t just talk about all contracts. Like this is the time to when you're talking about planning, and I always talk about business continuity planning, right? Um, you, there's, uh, and, I, and I say these to, this to clients, it's one day it's going to rain. It, you know it's going to rain. So you, be, you prepare for that. You prepare for the storm. So, um, you know, what other contracts can you renegotiate to, to work on your cash flow? And there might be, maybe you can extend the terms for payment for some of those liabilities that you have. So instead of doing a 30 day net, it's a 60 or a 90 day net, or you, you pay less and you start to do that now so that you can project um, and, and, and work on how to stabilize your business. And that's with any contract you, you, you have. It does not hurt to ask. 10% of something is a better, better than 100% of nothing. So people will want to work with you. One other thing that commercial tenants can offer is I spoke to a tenant today who put up six months of the security deposit. They can offer that the landlord take one or two months and offer to pay that back at a later time. And that's a way of being able to keep some cash. All right, we want to um, just do a couple more questions. We want to close out seven-ish. Um, and these are related to, these are like employee business uh, questions. So, so the first one in that, in that genre is um, uh, what obligations, if any, does an employer have to continue paying employees uh, when they are, when the business is, is, is shut down. You want me to answer that one? So, um, two things. There's not really, like, if you're not, in, unless you have an employment contract, um, there's probably no obligation. You're, they're at will employees. So what that means is that if you need to lay off or furlough, so uh, an employee, you can do that. If you're not, if you're going for a PPP money, you may have to lay off um, an employee until you are able to obtain that money. And then you have a certain amount of time to obtain that money and use that money. Uh, with now, I, I want to go back to something that was said a little bit earlier regarding the employees coming back. You have to give the employee a notice once you've laid them off that, well, you should give them a, for a, we can help with this too, a notice that you're laying them off, but then also a notice once you've laid them off that, and they, they need to come back, that they need to come back. If they decide that they don't want to come back and, and, and Siobhan spoke about this because of the unemployment insurance issue, as long as you've given, given them that notice and it's a proper way to write it and they don't come back, then that won't be counted against you for the PPP. And that's very important, but it has to be in writing. You have to give them the notice. And so you are not obligated to go under or continue to pay employees. Now, there might be some different, there might be different um, rules if the employee is sick and, 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 it, 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 so there, there are different federal rules now that if somebody is diagnosed with COVID, there's a certain amount of sick time that you have to give them, which I do believe there are loan programs that can help you pay for that time. So I, I hope that answered uh, your question. Okay. Um, another question is unemployment uh, eligibility. Uh, we talked about this in a previous town hall uh, from the employee perspective. From the employer perspective, what obligation do they have or, or is there, uh, or eligibility is there for an employee to get unemployment insurance? Um, what are the grounds, if any, for an employer to contest that, that eligibility if they've had to uh, temporarily or, or, or temporarily halt operations and, 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 and uh, uh, let people go because of the 
the, the government shut down. Uh, so, so two things I have to say here. So with regards to unemployment insurance from the employer's um, perspective, I think employers need to either um, confirm from what I from either confirm the um, the claims made by the employee employee. For example, Susan mentioned that they're going to get a letter explaining that they've been terminated, etc. Um, and they need to confirm that they they have been let go or um, if the employer could actually just do nothing. And, and that itself is going to be a confirmation that this employee is eligible for unemployment benefits. And and then, because and, and you, you don't want, there's no need at this point, you know, we're all in this together to take a hard stance because most likely, again, you, the employer, the employee is correct. You did um, terminate them. So it's better to do nothing or confirm. However, one thing that the employer should realize is that the ins unemployment insurance premiums may go up. Um, so what's, what's going to happen is that the state is going to take a look at, you know, how many people were unemployed, what's the um, the ratio, um, et cetera, et cetera, to figure out what their premiums are going to be. But hopefully, you know, I think people are working on this on the state level to try to um, mitigate the um, the unemployment insurance um, program and the, the harsh rules that may then fall on to the employer because the employer, again, should confirm what the employee is saying so the employee could get an unemployment but again, their premiums may in fact go up for the next for the um, upcoming year. So that's it's it's a little bit of a dilemma. But uh, I think if you if you think about it, that you're trying to help your employee, then that's probably the best way to, to look at it. So the employee, uh, um, un the employer is not going to be penalized for allowing during this time to oh, allow good. period. Yeah. Thank so you. there's an exception. I don't know the dates of that. But there is so so currently, um, employers are not being it's not being counted against the employers for allowing their employees to go in unemployment. So there is an exception. I don't know when it started, but there has been one. Last question in the employee series: um, What obligation, if any, does the uh, employer does the, does the small business have to provide? the um, personal protective equipment, um, to have a cleaning regimen in place. Um, I don't know if this is a legal aid question or, or an SBS question, um, but whoever can give employers a guidance on, on that, we'd appreciate it. So I can answer that one too. So I'm like the employee, employment guru this, this week. Um, so under OSHA, there is an inquire, there is a requirement to protect your employees. And because this is a pandemic, um, employees are required to take reasonable precautions, which include having access to cleaning supplies, having access to PP, cert, you know, certain uh, PPP. There is guidance, and I will have to get that to you, um, uh, council member. Um, there is guidance that has been put out by OSHA, and there's on their website, and there's also guidance, I think, in the Department of Labor website that will tell you exactly um, what is required. But you don't want to have a liability on your hands as an employer because you fail to meet the minimum guidelines to protect your employees. And employees have a right to a safe environment when they return. All right. Um, Legal Aid, can you just tell us uh, Second to last question. Can you just tell us, are there, um, I don't know if this was said before, um, um, income or revenue thresholds above which uh, uh, you're not able to provide legal assistance, legal representation for, for a small business? How do you qualify to get some legal aid help? Um, so generally for the, the um, community development project, it's 350% of poverty, which is pretty um, generous. I, I believe it comes out to about 50,000 for a, a single person. However, um, um, do, we are able to provide advice to anyone regardless of the income um, thresholds. Um, additionally, we have teamed up with a number of um, legal services providers and it's about now maybe six legal services providers from around the city and probably about 25 law firms. Um, and it's called the Small Business Legal Relief Alliance. And um, we've teamed up with those folks and we're able to provide assist, pr pretty quick assistance to anyone, regardless of, of income, of income um, um, level. So right now we've been very flexible um, to, in order to provide assistance to people. 
and we're providing um, the best legal um, assistance available by teaming up with these um, law firms around the city to provide assistance to small business owners from, again, reviewing their leases, reviewing their contracts, reviewing their insurance policies, to helping them negotiate with landlords, negotiate with contractors, um, in, in order to really come out of these things strong. Because we do believe that if a business closed down right now, it's probably not going to reopen. Um, as, you, as you said, um, Council Member um, Lansman, the vast majority of businesses in this city are 20 and, 20 and under employees. And we have a ton of clients who are calling us that are even smaller than that. And these people are not going to really be able to um, survive a shutdown without assistance from um, legal aid or from um, SBS. So we need to work together in order to provide all the services. So we've been a little bit um, extra relaxed right now in order to provide services to them. Terrific, and, and we're, gonna, we're gonna close with a, uh, a similar question to, to, to SBS. Why don't I just bring Deshaun back uh, into this? We're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna close where we started. Um, can you just tell us, are there any limitations on uh, the size of the business, the kind of business, et cetera, that can reach out to, to SBS for, for guidance, assistance? Obviously, each program has its own eligibility uh, limits, some of which we've talked about, but um, uh, is that, should anyone feel like, oh, I, I can't call SBS, they, they don't help my kind of business? Mm -hmm. So the, the vast majority of businesses in New York City are considered small, and a ton of our businesses are micro businesses with five or fewer employees. So for the most part, any type of business in New York City, you can give us a call, we can offer you support. I know for the Paycheck Protection Program, you have to have, I think it's less than 500 employees. So I haven't personally worked with businesses larger than that, but any business in New York City, you can give us a call, you can call 311. I'll put my personal information in the chat but any type of business, you can definitely give us a call and we're happy to, to support and connect you to whatever services that you need. Excellent. All right, that um, really uh, wraps it up. We, we asked a lot of questions across a range of topics. All of you have been really uh, terrific in uh, answering. It's great to know that uh, between the city, the SBS, uh, Legal Aid, which, which gets a lot of funding, uh, from city taxpayers and, and in partnership with some other uh, 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 law firms and other nonprofits, that uh, there really is a lot out there to try to help small businesses get through this. I want to thank uh, each of you for, for taking time out of your day uh, to come in and Zoom with us. Uh, I know all of us are spending a tremendous amount of time on these Zoom calls and, and, and conference calls. Um, but the feedback that I get from, from my constituents is, is very positive. And, and this, uh, this town hall tonight definitely was very constructive and, and informative for me. And I'm sure for, for everyone who was watching or, or dialing in or is gonna, gonna watch on the, on the, um, uh, the recorded uh, version of it. Uh, so uh, again, thank you to Legal Aid. Thank you to SBS. Thank you for everyone who, uh, who's participating uh, as an audience member uh, this evening remind everyone um, if you have any questions about uh, this evening's program uh, you can reach out to my office uh, you should be reaching out to my office anyway with any <clears throat> any problems that you might have and to make sure that you get on our uh, daily email list uh, again the contact information for my office uh, you can email us at rlantzman at council.nyc.gov you can call us at 718-217 Four nine six nine. You can find us on Facebook at Rory Lansman, on Twitter at, at Rory Lansman, or my council website, which you can figure out by, by Googling Rory Lansman. So with that, thank you all very much for your participation. Stay safe, and I hope to be able to see you in person and, and shake your hand, you know, like we used to be able to do, hopefully not, uh, not too far from now. All right? Thank you, everyone. Have a good night.